very excited about today's presentation because I am going to talk to you about this uh, open source software tool that allows you to build web apps and data apps very quickly and very easily. My name is Adam Schroeder and I am the community manager at Plotly. And as such, my role is to support the community in using Dash, in using Plotly, answering any questions they might have, and pretty much just spread the love and spread the knowledge about Dash to the community. So what are we going to learn today? <clears throat> First of all, I'm going to talk to you about what a Dash app is, right? What is Dash and what are the advantages of using Dash? Then we'll go over the five main pillars of a Dash app. I want you to leave this presentation understanding the foundation of Dash and the, the, the structural pillars of Dash. So if you want to dive into it and build more sophisticated apps with Dash, you would feel a lot more comfortable and it'll be a lot easier for you because you will know these pillars of a Dash app. Then we'll go into, uh, we'll build a more, or I'll show you a more sophisticated Dash app that incorporates graph and uh, data into the app. And then Shin Han will come up and talk to you about an app that has, a Dash app that has machine learning incorporated into it. And then we'll talk about the open source Dash curriculum that we have built together with a few other community members for teaching and learning Dash. So before we get started, uh, these are, this is a slide that I like to at least highlight two of the numbers here on the slide, usually the numbers that I'm pretty proud of. Uh, and they are that we have 10 million monthly downloads of the Dash and Plotly library. And that a thousand, by now it's a little bit more than a thousand of university research papers use Plotly or Dash. So what is a Dash app? So Dash is, is pretty much uh, a Python wrapper of HTML components and React components. And the advantage of that is that you can, you, all you need to know is, is Python, really. And you can easily customize your, your web apps with uh, the user interface. So you can, you can move around the components, you can, you can create drop downs or sliders or input fields, and you can put them wherever you want in the layout. Also, it's all in Python. So if you are machine learning experts or artificial intelligence and, and you wanna incorporate uh, packages, Python packages from those areas, from those fields like scikit-learn or sci-fi, you can easily incorporate them into a Dash app. You just import those libraries. Because it's in Python, any Python library can be used within a Dash app. And it's also accessible to end users. So you can deploy an app that you create and share it with your colleagues, professors, friends, whoever you want to share it with, because it, could, it would be a URL, a link that lives on the web. So a Dash app structure, like the five pillars of a Dash app. It's important that you know these pillars because it will be a lot easier for you to then build on top of Dash and build more sophisticated things with Dash. So I divided these pillars into two separate colors, as you can see. The white colors represent pillars that don't really change that much. Uh, and the purple ones are the ones that you build from the ground up, so they will probably change a lot more often. So let's look at an example here for the, for the white pillars. This is a basic, very um, minimal Dash app that actually is this. Just an input field with some text that is then shown on the browser as the title of the app or whatever you want to put in here. Okay, so it's a simple Dash app. And I'm showing this to you because I want to teach you the basics. So the very first part, as we saw from this side, is Python libraries. So here at the top, 
the first two lines is where you import the libraries that you need. Obviously here, we're not using any, any specific um, you know, uh, libraries like machine learning, uh, NumPy. We're just using what is needed for this app with some text. So you would typically import from dash to dash, uh, dash core components like the drop down, the markdown, the slider, HTML, and then output and input, which we will use for the callback to make everything interactive. The second line, you don't actually need to import this, but I like to use dash bootstrap components because it makes it even easier to uh, build your layout and place your components of the app in any way, in any place that you want on the page. So that's where you import libraries rarely changes as you become stronger with dash then you might add more and more libraries then the second one is instantiating the app so this also this line of code app equals dash underscore named underscore rarely changes especially as you're beginning with a dash app right you're beginning to to learn dash and build apps you need that and you need if you're using dash bootstrap um to to in your app, then you need to uh, define the theme. In this case, we're using a bootstrap theme, but there's many other themes uh, that you can use. So don't forget to actually define that theme uh, for your bootstrap to work. And then I'm gonna skip the purple ones and I'm gonna go to the last pillar where you run the app, the last two lines of code. Also, this almost never changes. Actually, the first six months, I usually just copy paste this because I never really needed to do um, to do anything with it. Uh, the only thing that might change is the debug mode from true to false, depending if you want to see live updates in the app as you are changing the code. That is true. If not, you put it to false. So we have the three basic pillars, the libraries, the instanti instantiation of the app and the final app ex execution where you run the uh, run the app. And then these two in purple, the app layout and the callback is something you will usually build from, from the ground up. So let's look at the layout. You can see the layout is defined by writing app.layout equals, here I'm using a DBC container, but you can, you, you can also, if you don't use Bootstrap, you can just use HTML.div, so it's pretty much the same thing. And whatever goes inside that HTML div, whatever goes inside that container is what will be displayed on your app page. So about 90 to 95 percent of the dash components that you want to be visible on the page or that you put inside the layout will be visible on the page. So this defines pretty much what the user of your app is going to see. If you want the user to see a markdown with some text, you'll put the markdown. If you want them to see an input field, you want them to see a drop down, you'll put dcc.dropdown. So this is, will define what the user sees on the page. Lastly, the callback. The callback is what creates the interactivity between the components inside the layout. Right, so if you want the components to interact with each other to have an interactive APP that the user can play around with that's what the callback is for. I'm going to show you an example now by running this code. Taking out the callback and just focusing on the layout, so this is debug true, which means it's going to update in exactly two seconds. And we'll see this here. And now you see, we only see the text that is, is inside the input field, type text. And why is that? Because this is our layout. And in our layout, you see that we have a DCC input field with the value type text. If I put this type text new or whatever we want to call it, it's going to update automatically. And this is what you see on the page as we refresh the page. This is the first thing that you see. Now you don't see in the layout there's markdown component but there's nothing in there it's an empty string because it's empty it's this it just becomes invisible and you can't see it right but we blocked out we hashtagged out the the callback so that's why you don't see any interactivity you just see what's on the page the the input and an invisible markdown we can actually put in the markdown 
Whoops. We'll put something so you can see it. See this. Saves. And then it will actually show the markdown because now it's, it has some text in it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to activate the callback or bring the callback into play. And like I said, this is what creates the interactivity between the components in the layout, between the input field and the markdown. So if I, what I'm doing with the callback is if I'm changing this, it's going to change the title, right? Title of app, right? So how is it doing it? So the callback typically has an output and an input or multiple output, outputs and multiple inputs. Every output and input will have a component ID and a component property. So the app knows what we are referring to or what we are using. In this case, the input, the component property is value. But value of what? We don't know what the value refers to. The value can refer to many different Dash components. There's dozens of, of components in Dash. So we know that this is referring to the input because the component ID is my text. So it refers to this and the value of my input field, it refers to this. So whenever you have, this is the callback decorator. Whenever you have an input in the callback decorator, which is always, you will also have to put, define the callback function. And the arguments inside the callback function will always refer to the component property of the input. Remember that the arguments of a callback function will always refer to the component property of the input. So in this case, el texto refers to this string that is assigned to the value of my text, which is this, right? This string. So this is the same thing. El texto is the same thing as this, el texto. Uh, type next, uh, next text new message. Or if I type here, title of the app, it's the same thing as saying title of the app, right? So that's, that's, that's how it's, it kind of is live, right? Anytime the user changes something in the value of the input field, it will, update and it will change automatically in the argument because this refers to the component property of this input and now typically inside the callback function right here inside all of this typically you will see things happening and you'll see this in the next app you'll see data being filtered data frames being sliced graphs being built um, and then something is returned in this case it's a pretty minimal app so we are just returning the same string, the same text. And now this is the second thing you need to remember very carefully. The object that is returned in the callback function is always assigned to the component property of the output. So in this case, the component property is children of my output, which is this. So this is the children. So this is assigned to the children right here like that, right? But it's not el texto, this is just obviously an example. So if I change this to, I don't know, home, this becomes home, and then obviously this becomes home, and because the object of that is returned from the callback function is assigned to the component property of the output, this becomes home. That's how it works. So that's how everything is connected. One thing uh, to add is that if you have multiple inputs, you will obviously have multiple component properties, which means you will need to put multiple arguments inside the callback function. If you have multiple outputs, then you will need to put to return multiple objects in the callback function. Okay, so let's move to a more sophisticated app, this one the dash app with graph and data so we have the three main white pillars here that don't often change and you can see it from this actually this is let me show you the app first this is it we have let's hide this we have the title 
right here. If I just move the recording a little bit. So we have the title, Mexico DF Airbnb analysis. And then we have some an input field, a rain slider, and then we have a, a scatter map box. So if you change things on the input field, it will change, it will slice the data and and then plot the data on this map. So first of all, we have these three main libraries that don't really change that often. And these are importing the Python libraries. These two are the first two that you saw in the last app, right? Dash to run the to run the app and then Bootstrap to play around with the layout. Pandas, uh, because it's just a lot easier to slice and dice uh, data, data wrangling with pandas. And then probably express our open source graphing library to actually build the, the, the map and many other graphs that you can build with it. And then obviously we, we do, we have the app instantiation, same thing like we had before. And at the very end, same thing, we are copy pasting, we are using this to execute the app. In this case, we have a port, so it just doesn't clash with the other app. This is 8006, so you will see here 8006, while this one is 8050, which is a default port. That's the only difference. Okay, so we have those th three things. And then we have, similar to the, uh, the last app, we have the, the layout, we have the callback, and above it, we have uh, a section where we incorporate the data into the app. So let's look at that right now. So as you can see here is where we are incorporating the data. We are, are using pandas to read this CSV file that I put on my GitHub. This is a raw CSV file that actually exists right here. This is the whole file. So we're reading this columns and rows into the app. I'm actually printing the first five rows. Where is it? Here. I'm actually printing the first five rows, as you can see here, with some a few columns instantiating the app and then i'm defining my layout so this layout is uh a little bit more interesting than the first layout that you saw because here we're using dbc row and dbc column to position the components of the app exactly where we want them like i said you can do this with without bootstrap but it makes it even easier in my opinion when using dash bootstrap components so as you can see, we have three different rows. In the last row, we have this graph. Actually, let me hashtag out the callback because you'll see that the callback is what is used to create that interactivity. So without the callback, you will just see an empty graph figure that's an empty dictionary. So if we go here, you see an empty graph. So this is the last row. The first row is just a title, Mexico Def Airbnb. This is the first row, just a markdown, H1 header, and the, the title is centered in the middle of the page. And then in the middle row is where, as you probably guessed by now, is where we have these titles like markdown components, an input field, and a range uh, slider, which don't do anything because I I blocked out the callback, right? So this is just on the layout. The user can just move these around, but they don't do anything. So this is the second row, as you can see here. Second row, we have two column components, DBC column. Don't do that. Whatever is in this um, column component, it's six units wide. Typically, there is a maximum of 12 of width of columns. So this is six units wide and then right to the left of it because it's under it right to the left, we have additional components. Uh, sorry to the right of it, we have additional components in there, so, as you probably guessed, this one we have select minimum nights and then that input component similar to we have what we had before select minimum nights and right under it the input field right, and you can see the minimum is one and the maximum is 30. I'm clicking my mouse and there's nothing above 30, no matter how hard I click the mouse. Um, so you can see here minimum is one, maximum is 30. The initial value is three. If we go in here and refresh the app, now it's 30, but if I refresh, you'll see the initial value is three. And to the right, 
we have another title and range slider right here. This title and this range slider where the initial value is zero to 2,500, maximum 10,000 and steps of 500. So if you go to the app, you'll see steps of 500 and maximum of 10,000, right? Here we're doing a little bit more uh, styling. We're adding some, some uh, marks on the range slider because I really don't want to see one, two, three, up to a thousand marks. It will be just too, too tight. You, you won't be able to see anything. So I just declared what marks I'd like to see on this range slider. All right, so we have those components. And now we're going to activate the callback or unhashtag it in order to create that interaction between the components on the page that will slice the data and then create the graph and return it to the page. There we go. So if I change nights, obviously if I do more, uh, more nights, more minimum nights, you'll see less and less markers on the scatter map box. So how is this, how, how does this work? Similar to, to what we talked about in the first app, we have two input components. Here I took out the component property. You don't have to define it. You can if you want, but this is just shorthand. Instead of doing this, we can just erase this and do like that. So these two values are component properties, but of what? What do they pertain? Because there's the drop down has a value property. The, the, the slider has a value property. So you have to tell the app the value of what component it refers to. So in this case, it's referring to, this value refers to the night input, which is this one right here, the night input. So it refers to this number three, when you first start the app. And the second value refers to the range slider, the price slider right here. So this value, this is a list. So this is very important to remember and to always check. I'm printing this out here so you can see this night value, this first argument refers to the first component property. And the second argument inside the callback function refers to the second component property, which belongs to the range slider. I remember when I first started with Dash, I, <laughs> I treated every argument and every value as a string, and I never understood why I couldn't slice the data and build graphs and do it, because not every value is a string. In this case, this value is a list. As you can see here, we're actually printing this out. So you can see this in the terminal. This is between zero to 2,500. Let's put zero to 5,000. And you see that it prints out zero to 5,000. So now we know this is a list and this is an integer because this refers to the minimum nights. So we're going to use this list and this integer to actually slice the data. So here we're saying this is uh, basic uh, pandas slicing where we are saying, look at the minimum nights column. Our pandas data frame has a minimum nights uh, column, which is hard to see here, especially when you're <laughs> recording a video. But trust me, it does. Um, and so we're saying, take, look into the minimum nights column, and only those keep inside the data frame only those rows where the value of that column is bigger or equal to nights value, which remember is this, which refers to the first component property, which refers to the nights input field. So this is right now, this right here is three, uh, seven, but if we change this to 10, now this would be 10, right? Because it updates as the user updates um, the app. So now naturally you have a smaller data frame. You have a data frame with fewer rows, only with those values. And then we're slicing the data frame again, where it's looking at the price column and it's going to take the first item in this list, which in this case is zero. So it's going to take all those price values over zero and those price values below the second item, which is 5,000. And it's only going to keep those rows in the data frame. So if I change this to, I don't know, 500 to 1,000, it, that's going to be the list, 500 to 1,000. And that's how we are slicing the data frame to only keep those row values. So naturally, we have a smaller data frame, but it's what we want. And now we're going to use this data frame to build 
our scatter map box. This one right here is what you are seeing as the result. Adding the latitude column, the, the longitude column, the price as the color, and, and a few other things here um, to make it even nicer. So we are build this figure, and how is it actually displayed on the page? Through the callback function return object, through the output. So remember, remember this. Whatever you return in the call, the object that you return in the callback function is always assigned, this one here, is always assigned to the component property of the output. In this case, it's going to be assigned to the figure of our graph. So you can just say fig. This fig is assigned right here instead of the dictionary. It's a plotly express scatter map, map box. That's how the callback works. If you had two outputs, you would need to assign, return two separate or, or same object. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite up here Shin Han to show us how you can quickly build a Dash app that incorporates machine learning. Thank you, Shin Han. <clears throat> Hi, so uh, I'm going to present the, uh, an app that I built uh, during my time at Plotly. Um, so the, the, the app is about uh, computer vision. So more specifically, uh, uh, the app was a real-time object detection app that was built with uh, uh, like Facebook, Facebook AI research. Um, they renamed it to, uh, to just FAIR now, uh, but MetaFAIR is a, a DETR model. Um, so DETR is an ob object detection model that was built around the idea of achieving high performance y'all uh, yet remaining as simple as possible um so thanks to that uh, after the release uh, we realized okay that's like a pretty you know a pretty flexible a pretty nice object detection uh, model uh, and so this we decided to like uh, build it as a um as as a as a dash uh, incorporate uh, the model they released as a dash app um so we built it about two days after it took about uh, you know uh, an afternoon, one day ish, uh, and uh, the code itself is about 200 lines um, and maybe like a hundred more to uh, on the model pre-processing side. Uh, and it combines uh, Dash, which is uh, the, the framework, as well as uh, PyTorch, which is what the model was released in. And then Piddle was used for uh, pre-processing. Uh, so I'll quickly show a demo of the app um, and then I'll explain so if, if, if you access this link, you're gonna get it. So I'll just uh, show it here directly. Um, so, that, so here, like in this input, you, have, you can type the URL of, a, uh, of an image. And then it's, uh, when you click on run, then it's gonna fetch the URL and then display it on the screen. Um, so if you wanna try it out later, you can just find an image on the internet and, try, uh, and uh, paste it here and you'll see how uh, the DTR model works. Um, and by the way, DTR stands for uh, detection transformers, I think. Um, I'm just going to show you a few more random images just to give you an idea uh, how it runs. So uh, this one usually takes uh, between 0 0.5 and 1 second to run on a CPU. And uh, it's about a couple of times faster if you have access to a GPU to run it. Um, so here, like um, the, the app itself, uh, the Dash app itself, that you control kind of those uh, those. Uh, components, uh, you know, those buttons, this input field, as well as like, you can also add a uh, non-max suppression if you want, uh, as well as a confidence threshold if you want. Um, so all of those are um, kind of controls on the dash side. And then on the plotty side, you have this, uh, this graph. So this is actually a plotty graph that is rendered with the image on the background and uh, a few bounding boxes uh, that are fully interactive. Uh, and by that, I mean that you can uh, zoom in on a specific part of the image if you want. Uh, you can hover to get the confidence level and the class. If so, if there's like you know twenty classes and you don't, you have instead of just trying to guess it, uh, guess it, you can just hover over it to get the class. And then you can also disable certain classes if you want. Uh, and then it's going to just uh, focus on the few remaining. Um, so um, that's that's pretty much how the app works. Uh, and uh, on the on the coding side, um, you have the the GitHub repository here. So this this one is fully open sourced, um, and uh, 
you can fork it and you can run it locally if you want. Uh, so this is the repository uh, dash dash uh, dash letter. Uh, and then, um, as I said, the code is about 200 lines. Uh, it starts off here, you know, uh, pretty, pretty much the regular stuff. Uh, so imports, I import a, few, a bunch of, you know, um, the, I import dash, piddle, and uh, um, as well as uh, the model that uh, is defined in a separate file. Um, and then uh, I have a few, you know, wrap, uh, wrapper functions around the components um, around more primitive components. So here we have, for example, HTML div, and then I abstract that as a row or column. But then uh, libraries like a Bootstrap component that was shown earlier um, handles that already. So if you use uh, Bootstrap components, you don't even need to define this yourself. Um, and then I have a few helper functions that uh, converts it, converts, does like a pre-processing. So it either converts a Piddle object to base 64 format, which is something that works on the web, uh, or it converts from Piddle to a Plotly figure, which is the interactive figure I showed earlier. So this is why here you have a little bit more kind of a fine grain uh, Plotly um, manipulation. Uh, same thing here, this is another function that does some uh, more advanced Plotly uh, uh, kind of, um, so, so this, this is more uh, advanced Plotly features, but if you just want to display an image uh, without any of the interactive uh, aspect that you saw earlier, then you don't really need uh, most of that. You can literally just display it as an image. So here you have uh, a few more uh, things, you know, colors for the visi visualization part as well. And then you have kind of the dash layout starting here at 9100. So like half of it was kind of pre-processing uh, for the image itself. And the, the actual like layout is pretty uh, straightforward. Um, as we saw earlier, rows and columns uh, layout. And then uh, it, by doing this, you can have exactly uh, each component in the position you want. And then uh, you have the, uh, you know, the slider, the checklist, th those are what you have at the bottom. And then here you have the graph uh, with the ID here, I define it as the model output. And then I refer to this ID inside the callback. So there's two callback here. Um, the randomized one is the little random button I was clicking earlier. Um, that's optional if you don't want it. Uh, and then the run model is where the action is happening. So I have quite a few input, but most, most of them are really optional. Like the really important one is the URL and the uh, important output is uh, the graph. Uh, so model output. Um, and inside the run function, what's happening is that I am I'm using the model that I imported at the beginning. Uh, I run a detect function on the image, uh, and then afterward, um, the filter box part is really optional. Um, and then afterward, um, yeah, so after detection and filtering, I get the scores and the boxes, and then I give all of that to the uh, pre-processing function defined earlier, and I get um, a figure, the plotted figure that you saw uh, in the app. Um, so in this for loop, I'm doing a little bit more post-processing, uh, adding the bounding boxes that you saw around the people, around the objects. And then at the end, I just return it as uh, as a uh, return it. Um, I return the figure to the uh, front end so that it can display it um, for you to see. So that's the end result. Uh, so this figure here is was constructed inside a function, uh, and the bounding boxes were all added all inside that single callback uh, that, was, uh, that was run when you click on either run that or a random image. Um, so I'll quickly go over the model. Um, so here you have about 80 lines, um, but most of that was copied from the official PyTorch release by, um, uh, by uh, FAIR um, when they released a debtor. Um, so none of that was really original. Uh, originally added. And uh, um, if, if you look at this, it's about 80 lines, and it's actually pretty incredible because um, usually like such models, if you go on the TensorFlow Hub or whatever, uh, and you try to like run their model, you're gonna have like thousands and thousands of lines. Um, so that was a pretty revolutionary uh, in that sense, because you were able to just, you know, use it as a PyTorch model. Um, so that that's why um, it kind of goes hand in hand with Dash, because Dash, you can build an app 100 200 lines and customize it exactly the way you want it to look 
um, and then running a PyTorch model inside it is really not an obstacle. It's really just uh, like what you do in Python uh, alongside Dash. Um, so rather than a framework that kind of abstract everything and uh, do, do a certain way, Dash is more a tool that you use alongside PyTorch uh, to display what you want to show. So that's pretty much uh, all for, for the demo here. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I hope this presentation was something that you uh, benefited from, that you learned a lot from, and I hope to see all of you, if not most of you, um, on our forum, on our Plotly forum, community forum, and maybe via email, we can uh, build apps together and, uh, and see you dive into Dash. <laughs>